The Lewis Burke Frumkiss Center for Writing and Culture at Hunter College presents 10 Years of Best-Selling Authors and Great Thinkers. Each week we broadcast new videos from our 10-year speaker archive online for free at our website. We look forward to seeing you again when it's safe. Please enjoy this presentation from the archives of the Lewis Burke Frumkiss Center for Writing and Culture at Hunter College. We have a young lady here tonight called Molly Haskell. Many of you are here for that reason. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little something about Molly. I only know a little about Molly. I've known Molly Haskell for many, many years and adored her for many, many years. But up until yesterday, I had never looked her up on Google and didn't know, for example, that she had grown up in Richmond, Virginia and attended Sweetbriar College, the University of London and the Sorbonne before coming to New York. I didn't know that she had been a theater critic for The Village Voice and then its movie reviewer. I didn't know that from The Voice she had moved to New York Magazine and Vogue or that she had written for The New York Times, The Guardian in the UK, Esquire, The Nation, Town and Country, The Observer and The New York Review of Books. I didn't know she had won a Guggenheim Fellowship, taught at Barnard in Columbia, or been a director of a dozen film festivals. All I knew is that Molly was married to Andrew Saris, whom I respected but had offended inadvertently, and that <laughs> Molly, Molly knew a lot about movies and was fun to take to lunch in the days when she did eat lunch. Uh, I also knew she had written some brilliant books, such as From Reverence to Rape, The Treatment of Women in Movies, A Memoir, Love and Other Diseases, as well as The Extraordinary My Brother, my Sister, A Story of Transformation, a collection of essays and interviews, and frankly, my dear, Gone with the Wind Revisited, which was part of Yale University Press's American Icon series. And to you, I say, frankly, my dears, none of it matters much. What matters is that Molly is a pure and unadulterated delight, and that tonight she will tell you something about her life in film as the Hunter College Writing Center's final best-selling author for 2014, Molly. And I apologize about the lunch thing. <laughs> okay. I saw you squint when I said something about lunch. Anyway. Oh, no. Oh. This is when you, all you knew about me was that I was married to Andrew Sarris. No, no. <laughs> Who am I offended? <laughs> Andrew and I, You I, made it up by calling me a young lady. You okay. made up for it, so that's okay. Lean in. <laughs> Hi, good greetings and hello, and thanks everyone for coming. This is going to be very informal, so um, I'm just going to talk, and if you want to interrupt or say anything or ask anything, please do so. Um, so now I've been um, exposed. My hope I can't <laughs> hide my background in any way. I guess that's true now. So anyway, I went on to Wikipedia to see if I was there, and the, it was all being done, I think, by young people then, at least that's what I told myself. So they had this entry and that said, well, Molly Haskell uh, came to New York and she tried this and she tried that and she tried this and, she tried, and then finally she ended up being a film critic. Well, you know, I was really lucky to be able to try this and that in those days. Um, some people, I think there's some people who are actually almost my contemporaries here, most of you are younger, but still, I think you'll at least recognize this. Um, well, first, I'm going to start. I, had the, I was thinking about um, something my mother said to me sort of later in life. She said, you know, when you first went to school, when you were five years old, and you went in, and they were taking all these tests, and one of, my, one of the girl's mothers told my mother that I went around telling everybody how smart I was. <laughs> so needless to say, I didn't make many friends. And she said, you can't do that. You know, you've got to ask people about themselves. You don't just talk about yourself. And that was, that was the lesson. I mean, it was in a very sort of explicit form, but the brain goes underground. Um, the way you ingratiate yourself is asking about other people. And it's like, almost like a split that happens to you where the kind of nerd or the, the, the smarty go, go, goes on. I mean, it happens to some extent for males, but I don't think quite as much because girls are really, I was talking to somebody recently about memory and how, I, some of, the, some of the guys I know are just so in, brilliant. I mean, they can remember, Andrew was like that, my husband was like this, 
and three or four of my friends now, and they can remember dates, characters, uh, lines from movies, events, plots, and I can't. I just can't do it. And I think I don't want to make. I don't want to. I know we are sort of leery of gender um, generalizations, but it seems to me that this is something that women or girls are immediately divided by the need to appeal to people, to serve other people, to um, embrace, you know, the empathy, all of these kind of girl lady lessons and guys are able to focus. Of course, they love statistics. I mean, there's something about, you know, the whole thing about baseball score. They can remember what the Dodgers did in 1956. If, I don't know if they were around there, but um, so this, I've been thinking a lot about this kind of dividedness. I also think somehow then, I mean, I th thought later that my interest, because I think um, one of the things, you sort of don't know exactly why you're writing a book. I mean, you do. I mean, somebody comes and says, would, would you like to do a book on Gone with the Wind? Yes. So I didn't even initiate that. But I think it's only when you're writing that you discover exactly why you're writing it in a way, what it is that particularly attracts you, your sensibility to this. And in the case of... And so I've, I've sort of alternated memoirs with film books, and, and they're all about role, about men and women's roles. I mean, my latest book is My Brother Becoming My Sister. What could be more <laughs> about roles than that? And what is a woman? I mean, this is a, a sort of profound question that I've had to sort of ask myself, and I don't really hope for any answers, but um, to, be, to be ever a sort of unresolved because of this transition that my brother made. But in any case, I think we're divided. Um, I've been thinking, of course, the obvious example of dividedness is all these immigrant writers that come, and they come maybe uprooted from their language and are writing in English, which is not their original language, the uprootedness from the tribe, from all of these things, and having this sort of sense of a split or at least not unified identities. But I think it's something that all writers have. Um, so in any case, I went to Sweetbriar, and in those days, I think the word career did not even exist. Uh, it really was all about getting married, and they had these ceremonies. I mean, the most important ceremonies was, was not, you know, the, the getting your diploma, but it was who got engaged, and they did this ring ceremony where somebody would pluck the ring off the rope as it went around, and everybody would get excited. So this was the atmosphere, and if people had jobs, it would be temporary. It was just something you did um, until you got married. And, of course, that has changed dramatically, and... Um, that, but that for me, I had this sense of wanting to write, but I didn't, it was very unformed. I had no role models, I had no picture in my mind of what form it would take. And indeed, I tried to get these jobs in New York, and that was when they didn't hire women. I mean, the, uh, advertising agencies, uh, publishing, house, publishing houses hired women editors, but th there was no writing job. I went to, actually, my first job, which lasted only one day, was at Time Magazine, and I had been interviewing there at, at Time Inc. for this and that and the other, and they, they liked me and they wanted, there were no writers then, so they finally found this spot they thought would be perfect. And they said, well, be sure you want this job before you take the physical, because that costs a lot of money. And so I said, oh, yeah, I'm sure I do. And I took the physical, and then they introduced me to my predecessor, whose, whose place I would take, it was something called Clip Marker. And you spent the whole day going through different newspapers from all over the world, and you would, with colored pencils, and you would out, uh, circle financial stories in blue and sports stories in yellow and <laughs> so on. That was what you did all day long, and I thought, I cannot do this. So very cowardly, I sent a telegram and said I thought it would be to our mutual best interest if I didn't <laughs> take this job. But I ended up getting a job at a... Um, it was called UNIVAC, Division of Sperry Rand. It was a computer division of Sperry Rand. It was sort of number two fighting against IBM. And it was a Girl Friday job. And it, it, this was the mid-60s. It was right out of Mad Men. I don't know if any of you have seen that. It absolutely was uncanny. Um, it wasn't a big advertising agency, so it was a little freer. It wasn't quite that conservative. And there were, um, I mean, there weren't any blacks, but there was a gay and there was a Japanese. So it wasn't quite that uh, completely... Protestant white bread, but um, I was Peggy um, with a slightly better wardrobe, and I wanted to, I was a, a girl Friday, I was typing and doing, doing things for, the, for my boss, and I gradually, they finally let me write press releases, which was a big step up, and it was the same, there was a, 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 a sexy secretary who looked just like Joan, buxom like Joan, and she was having an affair with one boss, and I was in 
in, madly in, in love with the other boss who looked just like John. He was a blonde John Hamm. I mean, the whole thing was just right in three martini lunches, all, the, all of it. And, you know, people say now, well, did you get paid? Were you getting paid equal? My friend Patty Volk was in an advertising agency at the same time, and she was very talented. She actually had a, a creative job. And she was very annoyed that she wasn't getting paid the same, and she was fighting for it. But I was just so happy they were paying me at all. I mean, it would have never have occurred to me to ask for more money. So, and but gradually, um, as the decade wore on, as you know, um, things were emerging. There was a kind of radicalism, feminism, the women's liberation. So all of this was coming together, and I think I was sort of ready for that. I was writing. Um, I had met Andrew Saris, who had, was sort of a mentor, and um, my beloved at the same time, and he was expanding. I, I first started writing theater reviews at The Voice, and there I was a low man on the totem pole because The Voice was, of course, the spearhead of off-Broadway. So all the top critics were going to the churches and the attics and doing off-Broadway, and I was doing Broadway because I was, I was four string. So I was doing 1776, and actually, <clears throat> I mean, there were some, some, some avant-garde things that came in sort of unheralded, and I, I did those, but it was just... It was an exciting time, and particularly when I moved over into film. I mean, this was the great period of the 70s when the, the whole atmosphere, everybody was seeing movies, seeing European movies, talking about them. You didn't have just every m multiple media at that time. And the excitement of it, I mean, now I think um, young people don't even want to look at subtitled films. It's just changed completely. But at this time, and Andrew had um, sort of introduced the auteur theory, the so-called auteur theory to American, and sort of elevated um, the, the American directors. We were looking at American, the classic American directors like Ford and Hitchcock in a new way. And then suddenly all these young people like Scorsese and Coppola and, and Brian De Palma and Sp Steven Spielberg were making their own kinds of films. And it was just a, a dynamic, wonderful time in film. And so that's when I, I sort of moved from one place to another and had the idea of somebody said, do you have a book you want to do? And I said, yeah, I want to write about the, the treatment of women in movies. And so that came about. But in the meantime, I had, um, I, I had acquired, without um, going to film school, I mean, they, they, they were just beginning to have film schools. And even writing programs really didn't exist much at that time, although they were all that was beginning then. But um, it was just an education, just seeing movies all the time, the film festival, the New York Film Festival, and going to the Cannes Film Festival. It was just a very heady time for conversation about movies and debates. It's just hard to, to imagine now how fierce Pauline Kael and Andrew Saris were at it all the time. I've been reading some of her reviews recently because of a pro the project I'm working on now. And, you know, it was, at the time, it was, this, it was an either-or. I mean, you were either with Andrew or you were with Pauline. And I think her, her acolytes of the Paulettes have sort of carried that on, but I actually think there's enough room in the world for both of them. So I have been reading her a little, and I think she and Andrew were very different. And I think people always said to, about Andrew and me, well, you, you, um, you, you both have the same, you both like the same films. It's because you're married. And I, I would say, no, we got married because we had the same taste. Because I really did fall in love with him, his sensibility in his writing in The Village Voice. Before I ever met him, I just, um, there was something in him that was, first of all, so incredibly knowledgeable. Well, he and Pauline shared this. They had a frame of reference that I don't think anybody has had since then. They could just bring up. Um, uh, film associations and, and information and insights. Um, but Pauline insisted she never saw a film twice, which I don't quite believe, but it makes no sense anyway. And of course, Andrew would love to see a film again, to see how it looked later. Uh, you change, the film changes, there's a kind of evolution that takes place. He was more scholar. She kind of turned her nose up at film school. She thought that was going to ruin all the fun. And Andrew thought that was all the fun. That, 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 I mean, he would have his classes. Um, and it's, it's something that it's almost, I'm always sorry in some ways that I've read Marty Scorsese talk about. I mean, these directors are so, some of their, their filmmaking is so sophisticated. They're so aware of all the films that have gone before, their references. I mean, it's not that anyone needs to get all that, but there's a kind of film literacy of the, 
of the visual, and this was something Andrew said he didn't have to begin with. He didn't see camera movements and see what was going on visually. He, like most of us, listened more than he saw. Most of us are much more attuned to dialogue than we are to camera movements, for example. But he forced himself to look and, and sort of make sense. And this is really what the auteur theory was in, in finding the expressiveness, how a director used the camera or, or, or the, say, the composition of a scene and what, what was going on in the background and all these things that most of us are so caught up in the plot we don't notice. And so he would make his film, his film students look at a film away from class and count the number of cuts. And they hated doing it because it just stopped the flow. Every time you do that, you just it stops the flow. And, it, and he would deconstruct it that way, make them break it up into all the parts. And he said, you're going to hate this now because the first, the primal experience of movies is as if something, it's almost magical, like when you're young and it's just there they are. You don't think, you don't even know there's a script. These are just real people up there telling the story. And then gradually you have a more sophisticated view and you break it down and that's a very uncomfortable time. And then once you put it back together though, it's the richest of all because you have this kind of um, a sense of the complexity of it and the nuance. So I think he was such a teacher that way and I, I was comparing him, I don't know why I'm even getting into this, except it's just on my mind now, but um, to Pauline, because I'm, I'm doing something on Spielberg, and she was very good on Spielberg, and she wasn't either wildly enthusiastic, nor was she wildly negative, and I think actually that's when she's at her best. But when she gets really enthusiastic, I was reading a, her review of Carrie, and it's as if she doesn't trust the reader to make up his own mind. She's got to explain everything. She's got to not only explain everything, but take any argument you might have and turn it into an asset. And it's like a teacher that just won't let a student think for themselves. And I think she did that because she didn't trust her readers to understand it. She had to understand it for them. But that said, she was a wonderful, lively, and I think she and Andrew both got people excited, as did other critics. There were just a lot of good writers on film at the time. So that to me was just, just a transform that that and and the women's movement were to me just transformative and I think when you I think well feminism made me who I am but I think you come to it all ready for it I mean I had begun even though it hadn't the, we hadn't didn't have the conceptual or uh, the vocabulary for it say in the 60s uh, the early 60s um, we were looking at we had begun looking at foreign films. Um, I, I was never a Betty for I read Simone de Beauvoir. That was the kind of awakening for me of thinking about roles. But we were, in, at school, we were doing Sartre and existentialism. And it really was all about kind of taking responsibility for your life so that everything sort of fueled into this sense of, even if we didn't talk about sexual equality, it was women were emerging. More and more women were going to four-year colleges instead of junior colleges. They were um, thinking. And I mean, this is what I mean. Um, I, I was, I've been reading, I don't know if any of you have read Gary Steingart, the Russian-American writer. He wrote that um, super sad true love story. He's got this new, um, he's very, very, very funny. And he's got a new memoir called Little Failure. That was what his Russian parents always called him, Little Failure and snot nose and <laughs> things like that. And it's, it's just hilarious. And it's really, it's, it's also fascinating about what Russia was like when he was little and then them coming over when Carter had made this agreement that they would trade, they, the Russia economy was going downhill so Carter would give them grain and they would give us Jews. We needed Jews, they needed grain. So, <laughs> you know, and he goes into all that. And of course he's written, um, He's very young, but he's written a lot of novels um, featuring disguised versions, I guess, of his parents. And they're just shuddering at the thought of this memoir that's coming out, which he's interviewing him for. And at one point, his mother, and he's very close to both of them. They're very interesting, idiosyncratic, wonderful characters. And at one point, his mother says, um, I, don't, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. And he's shocked. He said, how could she say this? I've been by her side until... I, until we came to America, and, then, and they've been in America as long as he has. Of course, he's living separate from them now. And I've, I've thought a lot about this, and I thought, well, it's not just because he's got his own life here, and he's writing in English, and, and um, he, he, he's sort of become Americanized in maybe ways they haven't. I think it's really because he's a writer, and 
I thought about um, when I wrote Love and Other Infectious Diseases, which was about this illness that Andrew had, this, uh, this illness that everybody, he should have died from and luckily didn't. Um, but it was really about that and that, about the relationship and about how I suddenly discovered, after thinking that I had become this incredibly independent and autonomous woman, that how dependent I was on him. And this was a shock and I thought I was going to lose him anyway. So it, it also was about roles. But my mother was just hor devastated by it. Even though it wasn't about her, she only came in sort of tangentially and in a, in a very positive way because she came up and helped and, and was by my side. But um, she finally, it took a long time, and then finally one night she wrote, and this really get, gets into how you write memoirs and what you do to people and how you, how you handle that. Um, she wrote this, I think, three-page, single-space list of criticisms of the book. And mo most of them were things like, I, I called her grand her father Yankee, and that wasn't appropriate. I mean, I should have said, I don't know, just words and terms and things like that. And also that she hadn't realized that I loved my father so much, he died young, youngish. And, but I think what it is, and I think it's the same thing with Gary Steingart, that suddenly here's this child of yours who's having all these thoughts. Where do they come from? You know, you think you know this child through and through, and suddenly he's got a life of his own. She's got a life of her own, and part of it is in getting a distance from family in order to kind of analyze and, and evaluate. And just being the object of this, however loving, a kind of critical distance. And I think this, in a way, more than what you actually say, is what's sort of disturbing and unsettling to the people you love when you write about them. In any case, there's a lot of, uh, of pitfalls, as you probably n either know or imagine, writing about loved ones, especially if they're still alive. So when I did this book, my, my brother, um, who was named Chivy Haskell, and five years younger, came up in 2006 to visit Andrew and me and said, I have something to talk to you about. And he laid this bombshell that he was going to become a woman that he, he'd had this compulsion, this feeling for as long as he could remember. Now, this was completely, um, it just took us completely by surprise because he'd been married twice. He was married then. He was getting divorced from his second wife. He was a real guy. He, uh, he, he had just, um, I mean, he never was a, a, a sports fiend or a macho or anything like that, but just a solid, solid, fairly conservative guy. And, it was the whole thing was mind-boggling, and I, he 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 gave me to understand because I didn't understand any. And of course, here I had been sort of promoting the idea that um, that, the, that the sort of boundaries that that men and women's roles are that this trying to sort of challenge the stereotypes of male and female roles. I mean, that was what writing about women in film or the the idea of women as being treated primarily as objects and uh, rather than subjects. Uh, the whole arguments of feminism. Um, about uh, a sort of more latitude for women in terms of what they could do and what they were expected to do and, 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 and their lives. So here was an example of somebody who was really stretching the boundaries and I just was um, completely um, b beside myself. And, you know, other people, it's interesting, th there's so much variety, what I found out since doing that, the, well, as far as, the family thing, I only would have, the first thing, one of the first things he said when he told me about this, he says, you, you've got to promise me one thing, you won't write about this. <laughs> so I said, of course, of course, I would promise anything. But gradually, when, well, for, and he gave me to understand, I said, why now at this late date, he's 60 years old, he said, well, because the urge grows stronger as you get older, at least in his particular type of transsexual. He said, it's not about sex, it's not about sexual orientation, it's about identity, and you don't want to die in what you think is the wrong body. So all this time, he had been, his sense of himself, inner sense of himself, was as a woman, and he imagined himself in women's clothes, all of this, and yet he was always straining to have to, to behave in a manly way, so as not to give this thing away. I mean, the whole thing is still so puzzling to me and so freakish, and I think it's even more so in that because he has become a she, not a kind of drag queen or nothing sort of, I think she doesn't fit the mold of the transgressive. She's 
she's a lady and she lives in this mountain community in Virginia and the people there, they only know her as a woman. They completely accept her as a woman. And they said, I interviewed them about when I was doing the book, and they think of her as like this quintessential Virginia lady. So, <laughs> so it's had this happy outcome for her, not so much for the, the second wife, unfortunately. I mean, I, I felt like, I think it's a, it is a tricky thing to write about people who are alive. I think. Um, I mean, I would still do it again, I guess, but I felt like I almost had to give the book over to Ellen, as she, she is called now. And in a way, I'm glad I wanted, I wanted her involvement. What, it, what happened was, as she got, when he became she, she met uh, other transsexuals who were having a terrible time and just didn't know which way to turn, and their families were disowning them. I mean, there were horror stories about just being completely disowned by their families. And, you know, I understand it. I, this is what, in a, in a way, who the book was for, these families that just can't cope with this. And, and it's understandable because nobody really, I think if we understood it, if there were some, if we could pinpoint some biological marker for it, or, or even some specific environmental influence, but we can't. It just, it's just a mystery, and it strikes everybody differently. And there's also, um, as I found out later, a lot of kind of political correctness because a lot of transsexuals, say male to female, say they never were women. I mean, they never were men, and they even change the sex on their birth certificates. So in other words, they kind of annul their whole previous life, which um, I guess is the way they f feel they have to do it. Ellen Chiviet doesn't feel that way. and. So what I expected to have this, this huge sense of loss, losing my brother, and I said, I hope you're not going to change because he was always, good. Andrew and I were sort of hopeless about technological things and money, and he was very good. He was a money manager. He was self-employed, so he didn't have to worry about an employer. Um, and he was, I said, I hope when you take all these hormones, you're not going to get stupid about, about money and, and, te and tech and the computer. And he didn't. And in a way, I think in some ways I have the best of both worlds because he st she is still good. I, I, I still can't always get the pronouns straight. But she is still great at many of the things uh, she, he was always good at. And he always had tremendous empathy. I think he had maybe female qual some kind of female qualities in him already. But... It's it's still something that I and I, I absolutely understand why people shrink from it, why they don't really want to know about do it. I mean, we've had to contend deal with so many bizarre phenomena, or even even just ha having to deal with gay marriage has been hard for a lot of people. And we've finally done that, and now we've got this new thing that we can't possibly understand, and it seems to cut at the core of who we think we are. I mean, isn't that the one? immutable thing that we're born male or female unless there's some you know physical anomaly or physical genital anomaly like hermaphroditism which you can't call that that anymore there are this, all these sort of politically correct terms but um, it just it just um, it is it, it just seems to unseat the one thing that we think we know the one that sort of first marker of identity that we have when we're born as being male and female and now you have these kids going to school and boys in dresses and all of this and nobody knowing quite how to deal with it what it means i think as there have been with transsexuals there will be there are monitors like for instance when chivy was going to become ellen chivy was a john chivis haskell family name uh, but he had to go through a year of presenting as a woman before he could have the sex change. And the reason for this is just to make sure the person knows what to expect, is not expecting too much. I mean, there have been a lot of stories. Renee Richards was one. Um, she, she was very disappointed. She, she never would have changed. She said she had to do it. It really, I think, when you meet people like this, it just, there's just no other way. And Chivy actually said that short of suicide, um, uh, no, short of knowing that it would kill him, the surgery, he would do it, no matter what. He, he just it felt, because it had gotten so hard to be a man in the world. But Renee Richards felt that she was going to have a little more, because he had, Richard Raskin had been very attractive, ophthalmologist, very successful, very good looking, and then suddenly he was this middle-aged woman. I think that was a while back, so things, I think things are, are, are improved now. But she had a few dates and that was it. You know, her shelf life, it was over. So she was deeply disappointed about that and uh, because she didn't feel authentic because she didn't have the biological equipment of a woman. I don't think people feel that way. And, and anyway, 
this whole question, and this is why, what gets back to the sense of dividedness, wh what is authentic anymore? It's very hard to say because we are these different selves. I think this is what we acknowledge more, I think, uh, the, the psychoanalysis and psychotherapy and just the sort of the sophistication of, of brain studies and neuroscience and we see how um, we used to think there was a real per there's a superficial person here and then there's a real person down here but in, in effect all of these selves are real the, 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 self, the social self you're different with one person than another so all of these are kind of legitimate selves and I think Gary Steingart's mother was shocked to see this self in him that she didn't know. I mean, a mother really thinks she knows her son through and through. But um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of frightening time because of this instability. I mean, if people can change sex, what, what, what you know, what is this? I mean, I'm as, as staggered by it as, as the, the lay person who doesn't know anything about it. All I can say is that following it, I felt, I felt, the compulsion of it. It's, I mean, I, I would call it a fantasy, except that t sounds almost too lightweight. It's much deeper and more um, all-encompassing. For instance, he had the name Ellen, and his wife Eleanor said, why do, why do you have to have the name Ellen? It's so close to mine. And he said, well, because this is the name I chose when I was, I, I was hoping that he had, at one point earlier, he had hoped to go through with this, and there was just no information and no doctors knew anything about it. So he gave up and went back. But he chose this name for himself, was Ellen. and when he would lie in bed, and he, he would be Ellen. And he just, that was the name. He could not let it go. And he would tell me funny things like, when we lived in um, this house where um, I was downstairs and the phone was upstairs, and he came down to get me, because somebody called late at night, and he had put on toenail polish. Because they, they would do things like that, and he didn't have time to take it off, and he was just terrified that when I followed him upstairs, I was going to see this toenail polish. And, of course, I, w I would certainly have freaked out if I had. And it's just hard for me to um, picture, I just can't, to, to sort of re-adjust um, to that, that he wasn't the, quite the brother that I thought, and yet he was and he wasn't. I mean, there was something going on, and it wasn't torture all the time, but certainly it was, and in some ways, I think I was more of a tomboy than he was. This is the kind of strange ambiguity of roles as they develop in a family. So, um, in the end, I think that, uh, there are things about, and the other thing that I was very, um, just more than skeptical, um, disturbed by it was this whole idea of th this sort of image of femininity, this sort of retrograde image of femininity that he was going to have to have because they, th they're in danger. I mean, if because if, there's so many kind of giveaway signs, they're large hands, the voice which even nothing can change, uh, the, the hormones don't change. The, the irony is that for girls becoming, females becoming male, testosterone changes the voice and brings on facial hair, but conversely for the male, uh, estrogen neither uh, does anything about facial hair nor the voice, so you have to go through this excruciating electrolysis for years and years and years. And the voice, um, they, they had to remove the Adam's apple and the doctor said one of the, one of the side effects may be that your voice register goes lower permanently. So she's got this voice, she practices, she does everything, but the voice is not great. Um, she looks really good, but they have to look feminine and not to, they, he said they're like, they take lessons in deportment and they're like 20 cues of femininity that you have to do so your cover won't be blown and there are things like um, the walk and there are all sorts of gestures as a doctor who studied, um, they even had a um, facial reconstruction because the male skull is very different from the female in ways that probably you and I aren't aware of. Um, but the dress, the demeanor, all of these things, and not being too feminine, because that can be a giveaway too. So, I mean, it's like a tightrope that they're walking on, and it's not just giving the show away, but the danger, because the, the hate crime, I mean, the, the hate crimes against gays are nothing compared to the hate crimes against transsexuals. And one reason, I, another way I got into trouble, I got into lots of trouble on lots of different fronts with the book, but, um, I, somebody went on to Amazon and said, I started reading this book, but then I stopped and nobody should read it and everybody write and say how bad it is because there's a passage, I was talking about Boys Don't Cry, you remember the Hillary Swank movie? 
and which I thought was a, a terrific movie. And it was based on, on that uh, Brendan Teen, a fascinating, oh, was that the different one? That was a different one, anyway. Um, based on the on, on real life um, transsexual. But my feeling was that there's a kind of bad faith there if you don't, if somebody is coming on to you, you really have to say, especially in that kind of fairly unsophisticated environment. And there was somebody, there was a young black gay um, male to female transsexual that got killed in Harlem recently because some guy came on to her and then realized what she was and he was so, humi he felt humiliated in front of his friends and all of that. And Ellen always said if somebody was interested, and she has that a few men interested in her, she would always lay it on the table right away. But I got into big trouble. I mean, they said, oh, why should she have to, the, the people online said, why should she have to reveal herself? Well, I think, this is, I think, the side of feminism that I don't agree with, that somehow you're, you should wear anything you want to, anywhere you want to, even, I mean, we know in, a, in an ideal world, we would be safe, I don't have to worry about that, but we don't live in an ideal world, and certain things set people off, and I think we have to do, we do have to take precautions. Um, but in any case, I think people are dealing with the issue, and I have to the best of my ability, and, um, and I think, I can't say that it's changed. I think what, what I realize is that it never ends. I, I think it's more resolved for Ellen now than it is for me because I'm constantly having dreams where he's my brother. And in fact, I had one when uh, uh, he was coming up for Andrew, she was coming up for Andrew's memorial service and I had this dream where she came up and she was staying in a hotel and I went to meet her but she came down as Chivy, as my brother. And it was this, thing where I, she had done that for me. She knew, uh, in the beginning of the book, I start by saying, because uh, this is really one thing I thought when he came up and told, told me this. Uh, uh, first, of all, I was terrified for you know, all, the, all the emotions you can imagine going through. But then I thought, because Andrew at that time was failing, and I thought, what's going to happen if he dies? And then there's a memorial service, and Ellen comes up, and that's all anybody's going to be looking at. You know? And I, I couldn't help it. That was. I couldn't bear the idea of a moral service for Andrew and Ellen, everybody gawking at Ellen, and, uh, and plus she feeling awkward. So, and yet I would want her there. I mean, she's the one I would want. So what happens is, so six years later, all of this has happened, Andrew dies, and she does come up for the memorial service, and it's fine, it's absolutely fine, but in some part of me still wanted her to come back as Chivy, and she understood that. I mean, she's just in incredibly understanding about when I make a photo, one of the, the first times we went out, in public, was in Williamsburg. I met her there, I'd done a talk and she came down. And I was very self-conscious and we went to this restaurant and we had our waiter, Rob, was, said, greeted us and hovered and hovered and then we take, and he came back and said, how do you like it? And I said, well, I like mine, but I love his. And then I thought, oh God, you know, <laughs> there she was sitting there looking very pretty and so she didn't mind that. And um, <laughs> the Eleanor at the memorial service so afterward, they came over, and Eleanor said it was fine except for one thing: you introduce me as your ex-wife, so that they'll think we're lesbians. And um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, that. So he said, uh, she, Ellen said, "Oh yeah, okay. Well, I'll introduce you then as my friend." And of course, that's not right either. It's there's no there's no there's no vocabulary for it. There's nothing that that he can you know. There's no way he can describe in a briefly or just in a perfunctory way what that relationship is. So it just brings home, um, I wanted to write a piece about, about the pronoun problem, but then I thought I'm gonna get, in th get into a lot of trouble with, uh, like one person criticized, this was a jacket copy which said her brother decides, the story is that her brother decides to become a woman and this person who was transsexual said, you don't decide to become a woman. You, know, you don't decide to become a woman any more than you decide to become gay. Well, yes and no. I mean, yes, you, you feel you are and are meant to be a woman, but you do decide whether to go through with it or not. So I think it's a very volatile, um, and I mean, you can see now, there are three or four different plays on broad, the Harvey Fierstein, all of these different plays, and I think people are maybe trying to grapple with it or trying not to. I, I can understand <laughs> both points of view. But I guess, um, so that that's sort of come full circle with roles and dividedness and 
the sense that we, we sort of have to live with these divisions. I feel that. I feel that I'm not, it's never going to be resolved for me. She's always going to be part brother and part sister. And I'm just glad that, oh, here's another uh, sort of political correct thing. Because it's very different with young people. They just take it, well, first of all, very young, of course, don't know the difference hardly of some, except it's, a, I won't get into all that, but I think there is something difficult about not having a demarcation between male and female. But I think young people just think it's dope. In fact, when I was doing radio shows after the book, they had this thing where you set up, you talk to somebody every 15 minutes, and I would talk to somebody in Missouri, and they would say, they would never have heard of a transsexual, and I'd go through this thing. Then I'd talk to Boulder, and they'd say, well, so what's the big deal, you know? <laughs> so, so you've got this huge divide in the country, and some people think, like, um, we did a, a thing at Barnes & Noble, and Ellen was describing what it felt like these years, and then this young person in the back, who I think was a, um, a, a girl becoming a, a guy, said, instead of thinking of it as a burden, couldn't you think of it as a gift? Well, he did not think about it as a gift. Now, maybe this girl could, and maybe young people can today. It's a, maybe it's a whole different atmosphere. Maybe um, they live in a world where there, there are no, um, uh, there's, no, there's no awkwardness about it. But for Ellen, it was not a gift. But I think um, it, it's kind of hard to everybody, in fact, the review of the, a very strange review of the book in the Times said, well, why is she so upset? Her, her brother's doing something he wants to do, as if, you know, it, it's just, it's just a breeze. So, I mean, there's a kind of strange um, attitude about it now. I mean, most people don't even want to think about it at all. Then the people who, who have and who are in that world, kind of activist world, there's the point of view, and then there's, um, the rest of us who are kind of somewhere sort of trying to make sense of it all. So let me uh, open it to questions and thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's okay. Uh, young lady here. Yeah. Um, there, uh, saying now that uh, all plastics, not just certain kinds, but all plastics, are hormone disruptors. I believe. And that women are getting more masculine and men are getting more feminine. And I mean, I absolutely believe that. I talk about that in the book. I think that's one of the theories that there's these um, hormones, these, uh, yes, plastic as the culprit in sort of feminizing males and, 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 and masculinizing females. There's so, the plastic in the water imita it imitates hormones. And so many women have absorbed these, and the fetuses are changing. The fetus, as, as this woman pointed out, they are the, the male fetuses are more feminine, and that I think there's a lot of sort of inner gender um, anomalies, kind of, or not even anomalies, but this is just, so it is a spectrum, I think. It is going to be, and I don't know how we're going to deal with it, but I think, I definitely think, um, there's something in the water, you know. And in fact, they found in some place in Chesapeake Bay, they found, what was it, male, um, some fish life m m mutating into female, or very feminine males mutating. So there are, these mutations really are occurring. They're real and they're biological. And I think it's something prenatal, but nobody can prove that, you know, it's not. Yes? Um, I would just clarify what you were saying in terms of your brother and sister. Um, I know some little boys, one is one of my grandchildren, and the other is another little boy in California, who sometimes talk about, and this may be standard, but I didn't know if it happened with my brother, when I grew up, I'm going to be a boy. Yeah. Or when he saw the Nutcracker, he didn't want to be, he wanted to be the shiver one there. Yeah. You know? But he seems all boy. Mm -hmm. And then this other little boy who's about 12, um, the son of a friend of mine, is always dressed in, in girl clothes and, and growing hair, and he just decided he was Yeah, which well, this is that, the, the difference is two young, two young children, one boy, when he sees the, the nutcracker, he wants to be the fairy, but he's a guy all the, all the rest of the time, whereas another one just wants to be a girl. And Frances Sternhagen, the wonderful actress, came to this book party of mine, and she said she had this grandson who, at age six, said, why, I'm mad at God, he made me a boy. Why didn't he make me a girl? And ever since then, he's been, she's been a girl. So I think... Did your brother show any signs of... Um not at all, not at all. And he thinks, of course, there was no name for it, and people, it, it, there wasn't any, any of this even um, sort of looseness about dressing or anything like that, but 
he was he thinks it came it's sort of at puberty and he didn't know what it was because there was no name he said he didn't know until Renee Richards which was 74 that that what it was and then he knew immediately that 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 was what he was and there are some people and there are a lot of people that do make make the change very late because as I said they don't want to die in the wrong body I mean now there are people who are doing it at puberty and that's good in one way because they can get them before the development of facial hair and all of all of the male secondary sexual characteristics. On the other hand, it's irreversible. So you, you sort of worry, are they, this is why I think it needs monitoring to see just how deep it goes. And, and you suggest that with the two boys that you're talking about. Yeah, one little boy is just definitely. Yeah. Yes. Just an observation. I think that the uh, whether we treat or perceive people uh, uniformly or differently is really irrelevant in the scheme of things. The only thing that's really important is that we confer moral and legal equality on each individual. Everything after that. Well, absolutely. The, the real need is to, to, con, to confer moral and legal equality. And for the longest time, transsexuals were, were way behind on that. There were no legal protections, nothing. I mean, they really were. Um, I mean, and even gays, you know, LGBT, I mean, they, they're included now, but they really, in some sense, I think gays resented them, and it was a little bit understandable because they had their own battles and they didn't want to just be, you know, this was the, the, fringe, the, the fringe end that, that, that was going to um, sort of, in some way, discredit them. So I think, but I think that's changing now. I think even if gays don't understand it, and even if they don't identify them, because this is the thing, that's the last thing most gays want. I mean, the idea of castration. I mean, most men just really, I mean, cringe. So they, I think the hardest, men have a much harder time with it, I think, whether gay or straight, than women do for obvious reasons. But yes, I think once you have legal, um, legal uh, things in place, then the rest will follow. I mean, I think that's hap what's happened with gays, too. Uh, yes, one, I think you just did a beautiful job Also, the relationship of children to their parents. Yeah, it, it's very hard, especially on male children, and that's what happened with Renee Richards. Her son, she had a lot of trouble. Her her wife. I mean, this is interesting to me too. How some marriages stay together, like Jennifer Boyle, and I don't know if you're familiar with her. Stayed with her wife, Jan Jan Morris, who wrote that wonderful book Conundrum. They stayed together, but a lot of others don't, and of course mine didn't, and I can understand that too. I mean, because it just you have to look back on your marriage and think what was going on. Um, he didn't desire me, you know, this worse than if somebody has an affair. In fact, he is sort of having an affair, but with his female self. Um, I think because he is the, the role model, you can't, even if you got everything legal in place, a boy looks to the father as this is what I'm going to become. And if the father is not male, then what does this mean? I think it's just, I think it's very difficult. I don't think you can ignore that. It's very, very difficult, especially, I think, for, for male children. But um, as the world opens up to it, as more, exa as examples multiply, it, it just will be more acceptable, I think. We'll take two more questions. Yeah. Yes? Um, I was, when you were talking at the beginning about the 60s, yeah. it was my year old when I grew up, um, I, you know, I was th I was thinking about how dangerous it is when you step outside your role. So I'm particularly thinking about women in India mm -hmm. who are raped or whatever, or in Pakistan, and it must be exactly the same for someone who is transsexual. There's such it's a threat. pressure from your peer group and society yeah. and it's very threatening. It is. It's very threatening because, for instance, like with Ellen, it's threatening because it's a castration and that makes everybody uncomfortable. It's also threatening. Suppose a man is a trap. Well, a third, one second thing, maybe we all, we all, I'm sure we all imagine what it would be like to be the other sex. It's a fantasy we must all have. And so men must have it. And yet here she is and she gets to do it. So there has to be a little bit of even envy there. And then suppose I'm attracted to her. And what does that make me? So you can see it just is one of the most disturbing things there is. And I think I don't see any point in minimizing that. I think 
we have to sort of acknowledge that as we move forward with it. Yeah. Take the last question and then. Um, yeah. Have a young person. You'll yeah. be able to go over and talk to Molly and she'll sign books. Go ahead. Who is the question? This young lady. Their agenda. Some cultures that there's a third gender. Well, it, it, okay, it, it, different cultures, third gender. It's it, it really varies in different culture. For instance, in it is very much so. I mean, we uh, people cite other cultures as if we could do that. We can't necessarily do that. We're America, but in Bali, I mean, in other places, I think more often than not, it's a kind of religious figure, a shaman. There's a lot of that. Um, generally, a, a female is second is you know second class citizen, and I think that what's going on in the in the Indian the Arab world is is really so much about the sexes. It's really about the, the threat men threatened by the emergence of women and the, the, the danger and the, and the threat of that. But yeah, I mean, there are all sorts of interesting figures. Even in, the funny thing is Iran, um, you, can't, it's, it, you can be executed for being gay, but it's, you can get s surgery to become a woman. Because there's nothing in the Koran that says you can't be a transsexual, whereas there is, according to the, the doctrine that they propound, um, against homosexuality. Thank you all very much. You can continue to ask Molly no. questions, but Thanks. you can assign those over here.